Grace Church here in the room, joining online. Let's all stand together, excited to worship and declare the great name of our God today. Come on, let's sing.
your name. We thank you for who you are, Lord. Your character, your nature. You know, speaking of names, this next song we're about to sing, it's called Gyro, and it come, comes from a Genesis 22, a passage in there. Just about, you know, the Lord, he actually declares, you know, the Lord will provide, you know, for us. And he's specifically talking about, you know, we always take that as he's going to provide our physical needs, but that verse is talking about himself. It's who he is. Actually, I'm going to provide you a sacrifice. And he was talking about a sacrifice right there in the thicket, but really it was a foreshadowing of him coming and giving himself on the cross, laying down his life, being the ultimate sacrifice for us. So this next song, we're just declaring that, Lord, you are enough. You are Jireh. You are the one. Everything that we need, all of our provision is wrapped up in who you are. So let's sing this together. Amen. Amen. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind. Cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. So you are a child, you are in love. Child, you are in love. I will be content. So clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't wanna forget how I feel right now. So Jaira, Jaira, you are the one. He's Jaira, Jaira, you are the one. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence and your goodness. Lord, just as a church in our hearts before you, Lord, we say you are good. We pledge our lives to you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for your presence. Lord, you said when we gather together that you would be in our midst. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good morning, Grace Church. Good to see you this morning. Hey, do me a favor, turn around, give somebody a high five, give them a nice compliment. Tell them how good they look up in the balcony as well. If you're online, we'd love to hear where you're viewing from this morning. Put it down there in the chat, if you will. Yeah, look a few rows over and man, there's you, 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 and all that. Go ahead and grab your bulletins, if you will. I want to highlight just a couple of announcements as we continue on our morning this morning. Appreciate you all getting here again the second weekend in a row that we've started at 10 o'clock instead of 11 o'clock and instead of 9 o'clock. We had over 300 people again for the second weekend in a row for Sunday school. So glad for those of you coming out. Again, 9 a.m. on Sundays. This is the new normal. We're going to do 9 a.m. Sunday school for all ages, Grace Kids. And you put your kids in Sunday school and they stay right through to, to Grace Kids Church in the well. Students have classes going on. There's a couple of different adult classes. Month by month, we're gonna be changing up the different classes. So don't miss out. I, just, I, was, I was filling in for Brandon because Brandon and Aaron had baby Hudson yesterday morning, early in the morning. Baby came a few weeks early. So I was filling in for Brandon this morning in the chapel. It's such a good time. But again, don't miss that. And, and be looking forward to the new, whole set of new classes starting in July. Hey, if you're new around here, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Right in front of you, there's a connect card or up in the balcony as well. If you're online, you can see how to interact with us. We'd love to hear from you. Maybe you have a question about Jesus, about church, what this is all about, why we do what we do. We'd love to interact with you, answer some questions and have a, an honest conversation about the Bible and Jesus and why we believe what we believe. Or maybe you have a prayer request. Let us pray over you. You can put that on that connect card as well. And on your way out, you can drop it at any of the offering boxes at the exits and for those of you that, that come uh, ready to give your tithes or offerings, you can give it at that time as well on your way out. Just look at this real quick. There's so many good things. I'd like to go through all of it, but just familiarize yourself with it for students and kids and adults and uh, it's young adults even this week, all kinds of great things that are happening and you just don't want to miss out on it. We have a, an equip happening on Tuesday night with young adults and just all kinds of good stuff. Well, at the beginning of, of these services, we've been having these times, we, we're calling them watch and pray moments, because in Matthew 24, Jesus instructed, he says, as, as the time draws nearer, closer, to the Lord's return, evil will be called good, good will be called evil, there will be confusion, deception will be everywhere. We're seeing this, as, as you, you say something enough over and over and over again, you're, you're, you're tempted to believe that it's just normal and true, so we've committed during these services to have these moments where we're talking about things in culture, politics, that are affecting all of us. That's why we're talking about them. These are kind of a family meeting where we're talking about issues that are affecting all of us. We found this video this week of just the, some of the frustration of the gaslighting and just the nonstop rhetoric that we hear from this video and this lady. We wanted to, to start with this because I think we can all at least connect with some of it. Let's watch this together. I never dreamed that I would have to face the prospect of not living in the United States of America, at least not the one I've known all my life. I've never wished to live anywhere else. This is my home, and I was privileged to be born here. But today I woke up, and as I had my morning coffee, I realized that everything is about to change. No matter how I vote, no matter what, I say something evil has invaded our nation, and our lives are never going to be the same. I've been confused by the hostility of family and friends. I look at people I've known all my life, so hate-filled that they agree with opinions they would never express as their own. I think I may have, well, entered the twilight zone. We've become a nation that has lost its collective mind. You can't justify this insanity. If a guy pretends to be a woman, you're required to pretend with him. Somehow, it's un-American for the census to count how many Americans are in America. 
Russians influencing our elections are bad, but illegals voting in our elections are good. It was cool for Joe Biden to blackmail the president of Ukraine, but it's an impeachable offense if Donald Trump inquires about it. 20 is too young to drink a beer, but 18 is old enough to vote. People who've never owned slaves should pay slavery reparations to people who have never been slaves. People who have never been to college should pay the debts of college students who took out huge loans for their degrees. Immigrants with tuberculosis and polio are welcome, but you better be able to prove your dog is vaccinated. Irish doctors and German engineers who want to immigrate to the U.S. must go through a rigorous vetting process, but any illiterate gangbangers who jump the southern fence are welcome. Five billion dollars for border security is too expensive, but 1.5 trillion for free health care is not. If you cheat to get into college, you go to prison, but if you cheat to get into the country, you go to college for free. People who say there is no such thing as gender are demanding a female president. We see other countries going socialist and collapsing, but it seems like a great plan to us. Some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born, and other people are not held responsible for what they're doing right now. Criminals are caught and released to hurt more people, but stopping them is bad because it's a violation of their rights. And pointing out all this hypocrisy somehow makes us racist. Nothing makes sense anymore. No values, no morals, and no civility. People are dying of a Chinese virus, but it's racist to refer to it as Chinese even though it began in China. We're clearly living in an upside down world where right is wrong and wrong is right, where moral is immoral and immoral is moral, where good is evil and evil is good, where killing murderers is wrong, but killing unborn babies is a-okay. Wake up America, the great unsinkable ship, Titanic America, has hit an, hit an iceberg, is taking on water, and is sinking fast. Speak up. You're right, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> that pretty much describes the Titanic, the twilight zone we're in. Uh, I put up a Tucker Carlson video uh, about the Thursday night where, you know, this hearing on January 6th went on and then all the news networks, all of the news networks except Fox locked onto this and went crazy condemning it as Donald Trump's fault. This was a historic blackout. I mean, don't, don't miss what's happening right now. I mean, this was across the board. So here's the truth. Almost everything we're hearing about what happened in Washington that day is politically motivated gaslighting. All of these media platforms are repeating the same lies. One reporter said there were five police officers killed in the attack. That is a bold-faced lie. The only person that was killed was a protester that was not carrying a gun. It was a woman that, uh, you know, was shot. So not one protester was carrying a gun. So how is that an insurrection? You know, that's the... The big question, this is a ploy to get our eyes off the economic recession that's being fueled by the price of gasoline that is the result of this leftist policy of this administration. They're creating this. So please, please, guys, watch Tucker on this. I mean, we got to wake up. We got to get on the same page about this kind of stuff. I put up an interview. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, yeah. I would even say... Even if you don't like Tucker Carlson, because some people go, right, right. Like the guy gets on my nerves. He consider, was the only voice. Consider what he's saying would be a, a good way to, a, a good approach. Just right. consider what he he's saying. He was the only, on, uh, we're not talking a little bitty, you know, things uh, elsewhere. He was the only mainstream voice saying, speaking sanity. I also put up an interview Eric Metaxas did. I love this guy. He did it with Douglas Murray, who is one of my favorite authors now. Uh, this will give you the cliff notes on his new book, The War on the West, which, man, if you can read it, it is exceptional. Some of the clearest information I've heard about what's happening right now. Well, so here we are in June again, the country celebrating great gay pride month, which, you know, the Bible says God hates pride and resists prideful people. So we've got a whole month where our nation is celebrating pride in a lifestyle that God calls an abomination. So I'm grateful is not the word for the five Tampa, Tampa, Tampa Bay Rays. Is that the way I had it wrong? Major League Baseball. Tam five Tampa Bay baseball players who refused to wear the gay pride symbol on their uniforms 
They said, listen to this, it was a faith-based decision, it was hard for them, but they believe in Jesus and refuse to put a symbol on their bodies to condone a lifestyle that he calls sin. Man, I'm telling you. Because we, we have corporations, there's corporations, there's various professionals where you're, Taco Bell. you're, you're forced to, you either get in line and conform or you're, you know, a racist or a homophobic, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're being the pushed. The coercion and the pressure to bow the knee. We're being pushed to the wall. We, we need to pray for more of that kind of fearless boldness. And again, I want to say, you know, we welcome people here who consider themselves gay. We love people that, that consider themselves. But we cannot, it, you know, celebrate that as a lifestyle because it's anti-biblical. And having said that, having said that, guys, we, we believe there's freedom for people trapped in same-sex attraction. So, and we've got people in our congregation who have experienced it. And we would say that the boundaries of God around gender and sexuality are good, not bad. God puts boundaries in the Bible for us around these issues right. to, for, for us good. to experience joy and freedom. The lie is that you give yourself to these things and you'll experience joy and freedom. Mm. We're saying we, we disagree with that. This week, we also found that a 26-year-old went to Brett Kavanaugh's home to kill him. He's one of the Supreme Court justices. The shooter was apprehended with a gun, knife, and zip ties. Now, that should have been on every major news network in the country, and they barely mentioned it. Just like they refused to call out and condemn the protesters who continue to march in front of their homes, issuing death threats. I mean, they keep receiving death threats. We need to pray these justices don't cave and, and keep you know, their, their commitment to vote down this Roe v. Wade decision that has been so lethal. I hope you had the chance to be here this uh, past weekend and listen online to Chris Reed. Man, that was good stuff. Both of those messages. Two different teachings, Saturday night and then Sunday, this, this get, service. There get two Sunday if teachings. you missed it. I mean, it was, it was really exceptional. So if you're wondering what he was doing, calling out names and street addresses and that kind of stuff, Chris operates in the gift of prophecy and a word of knowledge. And uh, we, don't, we don't call him a prophet. He doesn't call himself a prophet. So uh, in a separate meeting, man, I'm telling you, he gave words that were, <laughs> he gave a word to Bob and Paula Pickett that just blew all of our minds and blew their minds. Not stuff you can find on Facebook. Because no. I get the skepticism. And we all need to have healthy skepticism. But then there's also a place where healthy skepticism runs, you know, right. runs short and we have to have faith believing in the gift of and prophecy, this was stuff the supernatural. That, this was stuff you can't that, find on Facebook. This yes. was stuff of the heart. They were believing for, we all knew about, but not to the depth. I mean, he said stuff that nobody, nobody but the two of them knew. It was amazing. We're gonna get that story from one day, just yeah. to share it. Yeah, because it's gonna come to pass. The only thing unusual about that was that we had him on a Sunday morning. We have had ministry teams here, prophecy teams, for years. We do it after the Wednesday services. So. Uh, so, you know, it's incredibly hopeful when God gives you a specific word of encouragement and lets you know he knows your name, you know, that he's aware of what you're going yeah, and, through. And some people were like, ah, oh, you know, it's just general stuff, not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal until it happens to you. Yeah. Ask, ask the people that he ministered to if it was just general no. kind of whatever stuff. It, it, sometimes the simplest words are life-changing. Yeah, I, I'm taking time, I shouldn't. Shelby, on Saturday night, is sitting there, he tells her three of her daughters, tells three of her daughters names, which are odd, you know, they're not typical, you know, names. Sheila was one of them. Sheila was our worship director for a number of years. Shelby was on our church staff. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. So, so told her about a healing God's gonna do in her life. So it, it, was, it was really good. Now, here's the point. This, is, we, this doesn't change our direction as a church. We're not going to be a prophecy church. We're not going to be Grace Church of the Prophets. We're not, we're not, <laughs> no. This is about honoring what God is doing in the body of Christ. We believe what God is doing in more churches yeah. than just right here in our church. And we want to be somebody, we want to be a church that values what God is doing everywhere, not just here. Right, we want to get in on it, man. We don't want to just be, you know, one note and one flavor. So, uh, so God's bringing together a lot of different streams right now. And these guys are standing with us in this same direction we're going. Uh, you know, right now, we want to be about getting Christ formed in us so we can do the works of Jesus. So we're a part of the great awakening that's coming, because it's coming. This week, several of us watched a new documentary 
on the Daily Wire called What is a Woman? Any of you guys seen it? Yeah, several of you. Okay. It was painful is what it was. My goodness. I want to really encourage parents specifically because this is the <laughs> worldview that is coming in, it just for children. It's normalizing gender dysphoria and giving power and, and really shaming parents if you don't, even as young as a five-year-old, to make decisions on changing their gender. All right, we got a little clip. Who is this? Tell us who this Matt is. Matt Walsh is interviewing one of the, the, the leading pediatricians in the nation that is very for gender-affirming care. Watch this. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No, your, your sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. In reality. In truth, okay? Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No, you're not listening. If I, if I see a chicken laying eggs and I say that's a female chicken laying eggs, did I assign female or am I just observing a physical reality that's happening in the world? Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, does chi a chicken commit suicide? Let's does frame it. Because you're talking, you're trying well, to... Chicken has sex like any, like any biological organism. A chicken has organism. an assigned gender. But a chicken doesn't have a gender identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's... assume they're female if they lay eggs. Oh my, I mean, you, you guys, seriously, it's worth signing up to the Daily Wire just to be able to watch Le that. Leading politicians, leading people in universities, leading doctors, yeah, well, leading surgeons, nothing. fully committed to this to ideology. This, to this. I mean, it, it, with the understanding that probably within 10 years, Children that put on this are gonna get cancer for all this, you know, craziness. All right, God help us. If you haven't seen 2,000 Mules, how many of you have seen that, 2,000 Mules? Well, that's good. Uh, I, the rest of you ought to watch that one too because we've got corruption that has gotten into every, almost every level of our government. We have to wake up, we've gotta get involved if we're gonna bring change. In Matthew 24, 12, Jesus told us lawlessness, wickedness, and godliness are gonna, increase exponentially toward the end of the age, and we are seeing it. I, you know, I think we're just at the beginning. I mean, we, I believe we're in the initial pains of childbirth, which makes me think about Brandon, who just had a baby yesterday. Well, Brandon yeah. did, but Aaron did. Aaron we did. don't do the gender thing. Oh, we don't thing. do the gender thing. No. Okay. Aaron, his wife, had a baby. <laughs> baby Hudson. Pray for baby yeah. Hudson and the Hammonds. We love anyway, you, Brandon when, and Anyway, when women are going through, yeah, that's absolutely true. When women are going through childbirth, the pains intensify. And the, and, and the Bible says that's the way this is going to be, leading up to Jesus coming in the clouds. So, you know, we're there. We started our civic engagement team to help us get awake, to get involved. We, we have several prayer meetings every week where we are crying out to God for spiritual awakening, for you know, mercy for our nation. So if you haven't, you know, joined any of that, you know, get here. Let's, let's get together and let our voices be heard. I believe incredible things are gonna happen if we cooperate with God at this time. All right, let's stand, Wes. Yeah, let's stand and just, let's just pray for our <laughs> families, our, our Supreme Court. Father, we come before you. Lord, with all of the, uh, just the velocity of anti-biblical worldview that's, being pushed upon us. God, we ask you for strength to not be faint of heart and weak. We ask you for strength of heart and boldness and courage. God, bless our Supreme Court justices. Keep them safe. Yeah. Give them conviction to judge and to rule in a way that is worthy of Jesus. God, give us boldness and courage as parents and grandparents that we would see our kids, Lord, given their lives to Jesus in an unapologetic way. Help us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just stay standing for a minute. Boy, I'm telling you, worship was rocking this morning. Didn't you all agree? Incredible. So good to have Keisha back with us. So we're in the last section of Romans 8. Can you believe it? And uh, Paul has made it exceptionally clear that our relationship with God is eternally secure, and he develops that his final summary of Jesus' finished work of redemption with a series of questions. So we're gonna read through this together, and then I'll go back and answer each question, all right? Starting in verse 31, you ready? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes! Man, felt good, didn't it? <laughs> All right, you can be seated, thank you. It feels good reading that. First question, can any amount of opposition defeat a true Christian? If God is for you, in the Greek language, that's a conditional clause, meaning if God is for you, and he is, no maybe about it, you could even say, since God is for you, who can be against you? The question answers itself. The moment you accepted Jesus' gift of salvation, you were declared as righteous as Christ himself. You were ransomed from the obligation of trying to keep a law that's humanly impossible. Christ paid the full demands of the law by keeping it for you, and it's been credited to your account. Every barrier that stood between you and a holy God was instantly removed by the sacrifice of Jesus' innocent blood on the cross. The minute you believed in it, the law, the law of double jeopardy went into effect. God's wrath can never fall on you because it's already fallen on Jesus and extracted its full toll. So Paul's argument is that if God is for us, and he is, then who can stand up to the God who made heaven and earth? The creator is our keeper. Who can stand against the almighty God? No one, because there's no one greater. Not hundreds of thousands of angels or millions of demons, certainly not any human army. God is the one who guarantees that what Christ did for us can never be reversed, period. Second question, can we ever lack the resources we need for victory? As we go out and attempt to live the Christian life, we're gonna meet oppositions in all directions. I mean, especially now. Anybody who takes a stand for Jesus and the truth can count on you know, pressure and, and opposition in this PC culture. I mean, you can't even use the Bible definition of sin without people getting triggered. Or ask, what is a woman? Paul's asking, will we have what we need to resist the pressure and get to the finish line? Here's his answer, verse 32. He do, he do, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He's talking all the things required to live victoriously, no matter the opposition, the problem, or the odds, because <laughs> there are no odds with God. He loved us when we were enemies, doing our own thing, going our own way, hating him. Jesus didn't come after us when we were finally awake, you know, and got repentance. He died for us in all our filth and brokenness. Romans 5, 6 says at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us in our depravity. He did the very most he could do for us while we were still enemies, arrogantly rebelling against him. He stepped in, he took our place, bearing our guilt, dying as our substitute. So Paul asks, will he do less for us now that we're forgiven? Now that we're clothed, he's clothed us with his own righteousness, now that we're, we've been eternally united with him, now that every barrier offending him has been removed, now that we have the very nature of God dwelling in our born-again spirits? The answer is obvious, no way. 
God is all in committed to us. I mean, that's the message of the whole Bible. And yet we think, you know, for God to have done all that, <laughs> I better get my act together. You know, I, I gotta prove to him I was worth the investment. I gotta work real hard not to mess up. That's our human logic. But that's not God's logic. God's logic is, look, if I did the most for you when you were a willful sinner, how much more am I gonna do for you now that you're my child? And the answer is a whole lot more. Romans 5, 9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were still enemies, God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation, which is a word that means to bring someone back into fellowship by removing every barrier that stood between them. It's God's, God turning enemies into friends. Jesus removed every barrier that stood between us and God. As the only innocent human to ever live, the Bible said God was actually using his sinless body to nail our sins to the cross. That's incredible. The angels didn't understand that. Again, Romans 8, 32 says, he will freely give us all things. And freely means without cause. It's based solely on the heart of the giver, not the merit of the receiver. Grace <laughs> is the hardest thing for us to grasp. I mean, it goes against all our human intuition. So we wanna take that truth and we wanna ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us because we can't get it any other way. You just say, Holy Spirit, thank you that you desire to freely give me all things. Show me more. Make that real to me. Here's the third question. Can our failures reverse our justification? Verse 33 says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. The moment we accept Jesus' gift of salvation, God justifies us. On the basis of Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross, God forgives us and declares us as righteous as he is. And since there's no one greater than God, there's no one who can reverse that. Verse 34 says, so who is the one who condemns? And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12, 10, the accuser of the brothers and sisters accuses them before our God day and night. Satan's continually finger pointing. I mean, he's, God, I can't believe what Tucker did. Did you, you know, you can't get past that. I mean, did you see what he did? And the father turns to the son and he says, what about Ron? And Jesus said, Father, Ron believes in me. He's been declared righteous. Father turns to Satan and says, case dismissed. Amen. Now Satan will stand there and he'll say, I, yeah, but how long are you gonna put up with that? You know, this isn't the first time. And the father says, I'll deal with Ron. He's my son, and he does. You know, Hebrews 12, six says, the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. But God's discipline is from a heart of love. It's never out of a desire to punish me or destroy me. It, he never condemns me. It's to bring me back into fellowship so he can wrap me in his arms and restore my peace and my joy. We have to go to our bar of soap. You know, it, just always remember, this is your bar of soap. First John 1, 9 says, read it with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how we apply the forgiveness that God's made available to us. So here's the scenario, here's the typical scenario. We fail, the devil runs to condemn us, and he does it in our own minds, our own emotions, and then before God, but God refuses to listen. If he declared us as righteous as Jesus when we were enemies, he's not about to reverse it now that we're his children. So, so we wanna use the bar of soap get right back into fellowship with God. We don't put ourselves in time out, we don't try doing penance, because that puts us back on the merit system and blocks the flow of God's grace to us. We simply receive forgiveness as a gift and go back, right back to relating to God as a beloved son. And we're all sons, just like we're all the bride of Christ, so we're all sons of God. All right, Paul's fourth question. Can anyone condemn us for any reason? 
Verse 34 again, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Paul's answer to who's gonna condemn you is no one in heaven and earth because God's the one who declared you righteous. The only one who could possibly condemn you is Christ himself. And he's not gonna do that because Christ is the one who died and was raised, who is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. He's not sitting up there tallying up your sins, saying just one more time and I'm done with you. That's the way we think. But he's actually seated at the right end of the Father, interceding for you. He's committed to never stop interceding. He doesn't get fed up and quit like we do. Hebrews 7, 24 says this about his prayer ministry. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That's Christ's present ministry as our high priest. God knows you by name. He knows your thoughts. Jesus says he even knows how many hairs are on your head, including the one that fell out this morning. You know, that's how interested he is in the details of our life. Back in the Old Testament, Aaron was the first high priest. In Exodus 28 says, Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of judgment over his heart. When he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually, Aaron represents Jesus. As our high priest, he bears our names on his heart before God's throne every day. And when, he, when the incomprehensible depth of that, of that love starts to settle in, you know, you know what happens to us? There's no sacrifice too great. We're willing to give up everything. Wherever you lead me, Lord, whatever you desire me, whatever you call me to do, I'm, I'm in. Lovers make so much better servers because Jesus isn't looking for a workforce to serve him out of fear and obligation. He sent his spirit to romance our hearts, to make us lovesick for a relationship with him, like the bride in the Song of Solomon. That was the picture. When you really fall in love for somebody or with somebody, no sacrifice is too great. You'll do anything for that person. The whole purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection was to bring about this eternal partnership with him as our bridegroom king and we the, being the bride. And the way we fall in love with him is to study how much he loves us in scripture, asking the Holy Spirit for revelation. Show me more, give me more, Lord. Let me see it, let me feel it. In Ephesians 3.18, Paul prays that you being rooted, this is his prayer, that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all God's holy people to, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I love the way Mike Bickle does the best job talking about this of anybody I've ever listened to. And, and he describes the ocean of God's love this way. He says, the width of God's love embraces every person, personality type, and rank in society. The length of God love, God's love speaks of how far it reaches beyond our greatest sin and how long it lasts. The depth of God's love speaks of the lowest depths to which Jesus descended to redeem us. And the heights of God's love include the exaltation we receive in reigning with him. About 12 years ago, I was in a very dull place spiritually. I just, you know, keeping pace and trying to stay in there and not, you know, not mess up. And, but I knew, man, my heart's nowhere close to where it was when I started this race. And so I took some Bible verses about how much God loves me. I tell you, it was Mike Bickle. He challenged me on this. He said, you just take these verses, start reading them, and, and along with Paul's prayer, and pray that prayer and say, and say those things to God. You know, say those things to the Holy Spirit. And those of you who, who were here during that time, you watched what took place. I couldn't get through a service without losing it. I mean, I'd start to talk about the love of God and I'd just melt down. I was a mess. God was melting my cold heart. I mean, he was showing me, no, it, your problem is not a hardening of the arteries because your age, your problem is, you, you stop talking to me about this stuff. You stop asking me to show you the truth of how I feel about you. That's what transforms us. 
And the cool thing is our spiritual immaturity doesn't affect the way he feels about us. He never loses uh, or loves us, I should say, less today than he will in the perfection of the resurrection. A million years from now, he will love you 100%. But he loves you 100% now. It never grows. It never diminishes you. You'll experience a lot more of it in this age if you mature, but the love was there all along. The devil doesn't want you to grasp that. He works overtime to keep you on this little hamster wheel, trying to motivate God to pay attention, you know, to care about what's going on in your life. Look, Lord, I, I'm reading my Bible today. You seeing this? You know, I'm praying. I'm serving. Do you see what I did over there? That's the way the enemy wants you to live. He does not want you confident in the love of God because when that happens, nothing can stop you. Even when you stumble, you'll run to him because you know who he's, what he's like and how he feels about you. You'll never think, I failed. I sure hope dad doesn't find out. You'll think, I failed. I gotta go tell my dad. I'm telling you, that's the kind of internal shift that happens when you begin to understand how God feels. Here's the thing, you don't just suddenly know that one day. You grow into it by taking this truth from scripture and saying it back to him in daily conversations. That's how these glimpses of his feelings for you Continue to grow. You want to keep doing it until it becomes rock solid, just unshakable confidence. Up at four o'clock in the middle, you know, the night last night. And I, you know, it's, it, what's amazing to me is that it's become so second nature that I don't even realize I'm doing it. And all the way to the bathroom, which is where I was headed. I'm talking to the Lord. I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh, show me more. Show me how you feel about me. I wanna know what you think. I wanna know how you feel. I wanna, I wanna feel your emotions. I wanna see what you're doing. I wanna see your face. You know, I'm talking about all these things. It's, it's the whole time I'm awake, those things are going on, and I'm thinking, you know, where did this begin? Well, it began little bits of conversation back up over a decade ago. Okay, last question. Can we have assurance in our trials? Verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, this is from Psalm 44 actually, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. What a statement. We just read Acts 5, uh, 12 in our Bible reading this week about the early days of the church. Uh, the apostles were performing many signs and wonders uh, among the people more and more believed in the Lord, were added to their number. People were getting healed. Crowds were forming. The religious elites were going crazy and had them arrested because they were jealous. But verse 19 says, during the night, an angel of the Lord opens the doors of the jail, brings them out, says, go stand in the temple courts. And he said, and tell the people about this, all about this new life. So there they go. When they were discovered and brought back, the top guy says, verse 28, we gave you strict instructions, strict orders, not to teach in his name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teacher, teaching. The apostles answer, good answer, we must obey God rather than human beings, which threw them into a rage. They wanted to kill them, but a cooler head prevailed. Verse 38, he said, let them go. If, they, if, if they're doing these things merely on their own, it'll soon be overthrown. But if it's from God, you won't be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. So the apostles got a beating and were ordered not to speak in Jesus' name and then release. They got a beating. Just keep that clear. Verse 41 says, they left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And we know that was by no means the end of it. Verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and then from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Can you imagine being there? Because I think we're gonna be there again. I think we're, we're coming to this place of a great outpouring of the Spirit. Signs and wonders, healings, lots of people getting saved and the angels showing up to reassure them and setting them free and giving them directions. These guys got a beating and left rejoicing, which really must have driven the elites crazy. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and he asked him if he was a king, what Jesus said really explains what 
happened to the apostles. In, in John 18, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, for now, my kingdom is from another place. But it's gonna be from here. <laughs> That's the glorious news. For, but now, it's from another place. Just hours earlier, Jesus had told his disciples in John 16, he said, in this world you'll have tribulation because 1 John 5, 19 says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We're part, right now, we are part of a heavenly kingdom that's increasing. And we've been left here to bring people out of the kingdom of darkness. That's why Satan hates us so much. That's why he uses those under his control to try and destroy us. He's worked at it since the church was formed. But Paul wants us to know in verse 37, in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That would make no sense if his kingdom was of this world. Because Paul was writing to Christians in Rome who were being martyred. I mean, historians say that during the summer of 64 AD, the emperor Nero would sometimes light his garden up at night by setting, on fi setting fire to a few Christians covered in wax hung high on poles. In the city's largest sporting arena, the Circus, Circus Maximus, between chariot races and gladiator fights and wild animal hunts, the condemned were marched in, the damnati, they called them. They were some of the greatest, best of our brothers and sisters. And before the massive stands filled with 150,000 cheering, screaming Romans, they were killed by wild beasts, lions, tigers, bears, and leopards. Happened again and again. The Colosseum stood as a symbol of the might, power, and permanence of Rome, and a symbol of decadence, terror, violence, and death. Today, it's a ruin. It's a museum of a long dead empire. And instead of a huge statue of Nero, there's a cross. It was a symbol of death. It was a symbol of death. The Romans used to inspire fear in the hearts of the people they conquered. When they sacked Jerusalem, they crucified over 10,000 people outside the city walls and even ran out of wood making crosses. And yet a cross stands there in the Colosseum as a sign that the God we serve can turn suffering into victory and that even the most powerful, horrifying things the world can come up with can't stand against the, the gospel. The sign on the Colosseum cross simply says, they conquered. Whew. Man, oh man. <laughs> Peter and his wife were among those crucified in Rome. Here's what he says about our assurance in trials. First Peter 1, 3. Now, Peter's, you know, spent his adult life going through all this kind of stuff. He says, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though so now for a little while, you may have have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These hard times have come so that the proven genuineness of, our, of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Peter was writing this to Christians who were being persecuted, imprisoned, subject to torture, even martyred. And he says, because of Jesus' resurrection, we have a living hope that's not gonna vanish. In the midst of all these dire circumstances, we've got real assurance of the eternal inheritance, the rewards that are waiting for us in heaven. So guys, stand strong, that's what he's saying. Don't cave. Don't give up, don't give in. You know, God is a shelter for us. He will get us there. He's, he's strengthening their faith, saying, if we, you will lean into the Spirit, he'll help you in your weakness. He'll come, you'll, you'll come out stronger, full of praise and glory and honor for Jesus. But even right in, in the middle of the pain, maybe the worst things you can face, there'll be unspeakable joy that will be full of glory. People who have experienced intense suffering, the gulags of of, of Russia and China talk about this. 
I mean, there have been books written about it. There's, there's a glory that came over them that was greater than the pain. I believe we need to know this stuff so we're prepared for where things are going. God won't abandon us. He's not gonna leave us. He's never gonna leave us. He will meet us with unique grace for those kinds of situations. There was great joy in the early church in the midst of persecution. I believe we're gonna experience that again. All right, so let's look at verse 38 and 39. This is God's final unlimited guarantee that you can never be lost if you're in Christ. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, including demons, not, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing. And since you're a created thing, even you can't separate yourself from the love of God. There's no created thing that will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He concludes this passage by going through every conceivable possibility for how we could ever be separated from Christ. And he says, there's nothing, natural or supernatural, that will ever be able to cut you off from God's love. In the middle of the night, when your heart is panicked and, and your heart is racing, you can know, you can settle yourself down with that confidence that God's never gonna leave me, he's never gonna forsake me. Here's one last story, Polycarp, back in 156 AD. He stood in the Colosseum, sentenced to be burned alive for refusing to renounce Christ. Before the jeering crowd, the Roman proconsul pressed him, saying, take the oath and I'll let you go. Revile Christ and swear Caesar's Lord, Polycarp said, for 80 and six years, I've been his servant. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Many Christians, you know, would recant to avoid such a horrible death, so the proconsul Tried once more, I will feed you to the lions. And the old man said, what are you waiting for? pro said, all right, I'll burn you alive. He said, all right, I'll be a burnt offering to my God. Here's, here's a portion of his final prayer. Oh, Lord God, I bless you that you've granted me this day that I may share among the number of the martyrs and the cup of your Christ for the resurrection to everlasting life, both of soul and body and the immortality of the Holy Spirit and may I today be received among them before you as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. I bless you and glorify you through the everlasting and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved child, through whom be glory to you and to the Holy Spirit both now and for the ages that are to come, amen. And here's the account, here's the account that was getting, given by the eyewitnesses. Then the men in charge of the fire lit it and a great flame blazed up. We have been preserved to report this to others. For the fire made the lightness of a room like the sail of a vessel filled with wind and surrounded the body of the martyr as with a wall. And he was within it and was not burned but fell asleep. Wow. Polycarp's your brother. I mean, you're gonna see him in heaven. In the meantime, we're all gonna go through rough times. You know, those guys are up there cheering us on. We're gonna go through failures and setbacks and betrayals, suffering, persecution. We got maybe 70, 80, 90 years. But we'll have tens of billions of years in that, as part of God's royal family forever. The devil says, yeah, but it's, what you're going through, it's just too much. It's too much, it's too hard. It's, it's too much to handle, you can't bear this. He's a liar, he is a liar, it's not too much, it's hard, but God's measured it out. I mean, we read Paul's statement, he's promised not to let you get in over your head without making a way through it. And the Holy Spirit is living in you right now to help you learn to abide in Christ's love through it all. In John 15, nine, Jesus said, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. These things I've spoken to you, read this with me, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now, here's how it begins. You hear a simple message like this. Maybe read some of this stuff in the Bible. Somebody tells you about it. it starts with intellectual knowledge and you turn it into conversation. Lord, show me more. Show me more, right, Ron? Ron said there's a whole lot more of this out there that I haven't experienced. Reveal it to me. Reveal the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of Jesus' love for me. I wanna feel it. Encounter me with this love that surpasses knowledge. 
until I'm filled with all the fullness of God. Change my personality with it. Transform me. Because I tell you, when that knowledge, when that gets into your conversation, illumination, little sparks of insight start coming that cause you to go deeper. I mean, you can't, you can't not go deeper. You want more. You know why these guys, these kids up here that, that started in the prayer room have never left it? Because they can't. They can't, their hearts have been captivated. Little Olivia, when she was a little bitty girl, was playing keyboards and, and singing to the Lord, and Keegan and his brother Aiden, and all these, these kids, a bunch of them up here, were raised in a prayer room. And they encountered Jesus' love and it's changed them forever. They can't go back. You know, that's the point. You'll eventually be willing to pay any price to resist sin, to endure persecution. You'll have the courage to stay steady and a transforming joy will fill your soul. So you wanna start with the knowledge that God loves me intensely in the same way he loves Jesus. Turn it into conversation. That'll, that'll motivate you to want more. When I quit doing this, it amazes me how I slump into spiritual dullness, how quickly it happens, because that's my default. And don't look at me that way, because you've got the same problem. I believe God is restoring the first commandment right now so Jesus will have a prepared bride who loves him fully. We can enter into that by simply saying, Jesus teaches. Doesn't take fancy prayers. Lord, help me love you fully. I love the you know, L prayer and the fellowship list because that's, uh, that's what that prayer is for, is Father, pour out your love into my heart so that I would overflow with love for you and others. I ask you that you would put your love for Jesus in me like you promised. I echo the Apostle Paul's prayer that I would come to know the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of Christ's love so that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. I'm asking for grace to love you with all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. We were made for love. We were made for love. God wants us to know it. God wants us to feel it. God wants us to experience it. Perfect love cast out fear. That's what's gonna pull us out of all of this anxiety and craziness, encountering the love of God. God wants to be known, not just known about. Let's stand up, boy. We're gonna, we're gonna sing to him. You know, I'm amazed at how the train always slows down on Sunday morning. <laughs> we, we got through this earlier last night <laughs> but oh man am I thankful the Holy Spirit is here you know we, we went started worshiping last night and I'm telling you the presence of God is in this place he comes close in moments like this I've, I feel it I have been coughing my head off all morning and I just got through that without coughing. That's incredible. That's a miracle. I mean, you can ask Debbie. <laughs> oh, God, thank you for your presence. You wanted us to know this stuff. You want us to know how you feel about us. Ooh, ooh. God, I just want a heart that's fully in love. I just want a heart that is fully yours. Change us right now, even as we sing this to you. Change us. Come close, touch us. You guys know the words to this. Sing it. Burn it, on Burn it on my heart like a seal. Like a seal, like a seal. And the famines of your presence. Burn the floods. The floods of persecution. 
here's the one we deal with. In the comfort of the culture, it's still real. It's still real. Yeah, the love that you have, Jesus. Put it inside me, God. Put it inside me. Burn it on my heart. Come and burn it on my heart. Like a seal, like a seal. That in the famines of your presence, or in the floods of persecution. to them. Last night, I was just, you know, what in the world does that mean, Lord? Exactly what does that mean? And I think I know. God has come close to us right now. He has come close to us in worship and in this service. I mean, I don't know how that works, but I know Jesus said, where two of you gather in my name and you're sincere, I come and attend that service. So all I know to say is, I believe there's incredible freedom, healing, salvation for you if you'll respond to Jesus. Because his invitation is out. He's here. He's here in this place, in this room to meet you. So prayer team, come on down here. And I'm just, we're gonna end it in this kind of way. If you want prayer, if you are caught in a lifestyle, you know, some of you have just been dealt a card of, well, you know, you're not the gender that your body says you are, and you're, you're dealing with all the results and ramifications of that. 
God can pull you out of that today. Some of you have, are, are experiencing same-sex attraction and God wants you to be free to, to have a relationship like he talks about in scripture. Some of you are dealing with porn addictions that have gone beyond the boundaries that you ever dreamed you'd be in. Some of you are dealing with drug addictions, fentanyl. You're taking stuff that you know is lethal. God's here in this place right now. If you will respond to him, you can, you can leave this place going a whole different direction. I don't guarantee you that every problem in your life will change, but I can tell you, you will not be the same person. Some of you have never been born again. Today's your day. Come forward. Get your spirit reborn. That's gonna change everything. Changes the whole dynamic. So Lord, would you come among us right now? Would you do what you love to do? Would you heal sick bodies? Would you set captives free? Would you cause people who are dead spiritually to come alive? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now we've gone beyond our time frame. So those of you who have children in children's ministry, please go to get them first. All right, you even come back for prayer if you want. But uh, God bless you. We're going to keep going. Romans 9 next week. Whole new, whole new direction. All right. God bless you all. We are so glad that you were viewing online with us today. I, I can't encourage you enough to go through these scriptures that Ron is teaching. The book of Romans is rich. It has the ability to really ground our minds and our understanding about God, about who we are. Sometimes I gotta go back through the verses. And I've learned this, I, I, if, if I'll go back through the verses and turn some of those passages, and even the questions I have, into prayer with the Lord, we can never forget that the author of the scripture lives in us. If we're a born again believer, the Holy Spirit of God is in us. He is the author of the Bible, and he will help us with understanding. So I want to encourage you in that. Also, if you need prayer for anything, you can reach out to our church. You can see the number there in the chat. Reach out to us. Let us pray for you. Let us encourage you. We look over these prayer requests every week. We take them serious. Or maybe you just have questions about who Jesus is and what this thing about church is all about. I mean, these days there's so many different opinions. Let us help you look in the scriptures and, and see God together and understand what it means to be saved or be a Christian. We'd love to do that as well. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person viewing. I ask you to bless them, their home, their family, any situation in their life, God, that you that, that they need you. God, I, I, I stand with them in that need, and I, I pray, God, intervene. Be... Uh, in their midst and heal them and strengthen them and comfort them and bring clarity to the scriptures, to their mind and to their heart. God bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.